think we are good. All right. Hey, everyone. How are you doing? I hope that we are going live. I have my camera here as a, uh, here, let me change the slides so you can see me. Hi, how are you? <laughs> so I have, uh, I hope I am live here on the, uh, my Facebook page. Um, I am so excited to be here tonight and to share with you session two of our focus on um, our professional learning series. And we are focusing on helping students to overcome writer's block. And so if you missed last week's session, um, I had some great feedback on that from some colleagues and they were excited. They've used some of those strategies that I shared and they have already experienced success. So if you haven't watched last week's um, training session on our professional learning series, make certain that you do that because tonight's content actually builds up on that information that I shared last week. So how's everything going? Um, I've, I'm using my camera as a, my phone as a second camera tonight, so I don't have any access to anyone's comments. So if you do have some comments, go ahead and leave those in the chat box and after our session session today, I will make certain that I go back and check in on those and answer your questions. And if I don't answer them within the um, chat box, then it'll something I will certainly address next week. So um, how's everything going? I hope everything's going well. You know, um, today I had a new student start um, and he is a monolingual student. So as you know, I'm an English language specialist and um, he you know, jumped right in, wasn't afraid to to um, to do the work, doesn't really understand because he speaks a different language than the English. That's the content um, and the instruction that's delivered in that language. So, but he did have some three peers who also speak um, his language. And, and actually those three students started out this year in kindergarten only speaking their first language and are doing so well, learning so much. So just that immersion into their environment and um, not afraid to give it a try to, to learn new things and try to speak another language. So it's wonderful. I hope that you are all doing, doing well. I got to say, um, yesterday we didn't have school because we celebrated Martin Luther King Day. And, you know, I am so appreciative of other people who have come before me to, you know, help lay the groundwork on what we can do to be kind and compassionate towards others, to empower people. And, you know, that I was spent some time working on the, a course that I'm actually launching next week. So you're invited to come back next Monday and I, I will launch the course, which is like the next step for people who are looking to, you know, be that great uh, writing teacher and help help their students um, progress because you know writing isn't something that um, we have a lot of training in. We get more training with reading and not so much with the writing. But you know all of this goes hand in hand, and so I'm excited to launch this course next week. So join me next Monday, same time, same place, and I will share with you that that information and. Um, yeah, so take advantage of that course if if that's something that you are working on is developing your writing instructional strategies. Um, so, all right. So again, today's session, professional learning session, you know, we're focusing on writing. So I want you to stop and think about your students. Do your students struggle with writing, with content, style, form, process, perhaps the mechanics of writing, the characteristics of great writing? Maybe they complain or they argue or, you know, they have that sour face like, oh, man, I've got to write again. And um, they perhaps don't turn in very much or very little work. So if that's some of the struggles that you're having with your students, then you are in the right place. OK, we're going to focus on helping those students overcome those challenges and give you some more tools to fill in that toolbox so that you have a, a litany of strategies available to meet the needs of those students. And I know doing this uh, teaching writing with 25 or more students in your class is a challenge. Perhaps you're a homeschool parent and you have four or five children that you're working with. It is a challenge because every single writer has different needs or at different stages. You know, today I was working with some English language learners and I was doing some training with another teacher and um, just sharing some strategies. And we looked at each of the students and where they are and what that next step is. So um, it's a very interesting when you sit and you can analyze their writing and know exactly what to do next to move that student along. So you know what? I didn't learn how to do this overnight. Over my past 30 plus years experience in education, 
I have had the opportunity to work with a thousand students, more than a thousand students and parents to not only develop their writing skills, but to further develop their writing strategy. And most importantly, to develop that joy in writing, you know, writer's block in my classroom became extinct, like those dinosaurs extinct. Well, today I'm going to be sharing some valuable tips and strategies to assist teachers in public, private, and homeschool classrooms to support your writers in overcoming that writer's block and to be successful writers. Okay, so let's take a look. So our session for today, our Teacher Tuesday talk today, we're going to be focusing on number two. So as you can see, it's session two of a four-part series discussing writer's block and how to overcome the challenge. So I'm going to be sharing what I have learned from my research and practice that is successful in getting students to not only write, but become avid writers. That's right. No more tears, blank pages, or sour attitudes. Are you with me? Are you? All right. So let's go. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's do just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So during this session, I would love to hear where you are tuning in from. And as you know, I don't have my phone accessible, so I will definitely be checking the chat box to see where you're tuning in from later on tonight. Welcome, welcome. You know, go ahead and share those comments and those questions in the chat box. Share where you're viewing from. You know what? Tell us something great that happened today. I shared a little bit about my day today. As we continue our training tonight, if you have any questions or comments, pop those into that chat box. As I said, I'll be certain to address any of those challenges and questions afterwards, just because I don't have, I should, I should have brought my Chromebook to set it up, but I will certainly address those questions for you. Um, if you are catching this training session on the replay, make certain that you hashtag replay in the comments and share your responses and questions in that chat box. And I will certainly respond to those. And also friends, if you could do me a sweet favor for tonight, please click those like and heart buttons. So when you do this, this lets others receive notifications and spreads the word about our content. Also, I encourage you, I invite you to tag your friends, share this video and like my Facebook page, Blue, Blue Ribbon Teacher. And if you're viewing this on YouTube, Go ahead and click that like and subscribe buttons. Leave comments there too. Regardless of the viewing platform, remember to turn on notifications so you don't miss any future information and fun that we have going on. One more thing before we get started, go ahead and take a moment to eliminate any distractions. Writing is such a powerful tool for everyone and it is important that our students are proficient writers. So I don't want you to miss anything. If your goal is to improve your literacy instructional strategies, this professional learning series is a perfect place to start your journey towards becoming an amazing writing teacher who supports each student's writing too. That's right, each student personalized writing instruction. So go ahead and grab your favorite beverage and come on into class. Welcome, welcome. I'm excited to be here tonight and excited to see you here tonight. So as I said, today is the second session of a four-part professional learning series, and I'd like to share the success criteria as we get started. Now, the success criteria, there's four different parts. Last week, we focused on why students experience writer's block, and we learned initial strategies to support writers. If you didn't catch the first session, you'll want to listen to that session because session two tonight builds up on the session we had last week. And you can view the first session on my YouTube channel at Blue Ribbon Teacher. And if you happen to be a member of our Facebook community, Engage, Educate, Excel, I also have this training series posted in the guide section. And if you would like to join our online community, just, make, just go over to... Um, go over to my um, website, blueribbonteacher.com, and I have some links there that will, in the teacher's lounge, that will take you right to that Facebook group and you can join there. So now, if you were able to view the last week's session, thank you so much for taking the time to do that and for sharing your thoughts. I hope that you found this information valuable. I've heard from several teachers who shared how helpful these strategies are to help their students, and I'd love to hear from you too. So let me know how the strategies are supporting your writers. Share your experiences in the chat box tonight, and we'd love to hear about it. And I will go back later after our session to check the, the uh, chat box to see um, the experiences that you've had. 
So today we're going to be focusing on learning from the experts. Let me go to the next slide here. All right, so we are going to focus on learning from the experts. We're going to be using model text to unlock writer's block. An often missed resource in writing instruction is pulling on the expertise of our authors. I'll share some specific strategies on how you can use one book multiple ways, yes, to not only support your learner in overcoming his or her challenge, but also bridging that re, uh, re, writing and reading connection. And this is an extra bonus that I'm excited to share with you tonight. Next week, you don't want to miss, next week we're going to focus on differentiating instruction with multiple intelligences to unlock writer's block. And then the following week, which will be our last week, here we have all four, we're going to be priming the brain for writing and next steps for writers. Okay, so... You might be wondering, who am I? Well, let me introduce myself if we haven't met. My name is Dr. Annette Durbin. Personally, I am a wife, mom, grandma, sister, friend, and colleague. I enjoy family, travel, outdoors, craft, music, and game nights. And professionally, I am a longtime educator. I have 30 plus years experience in early childhood and elementary education. Now, 27 of those years, I worked in the classroom, all grades, preschool through six, as a gen ed teacher. And then I moved into my current position as an English language instructional specialist. Now, since 2005, I have been a national board certified teacher and continue mentoring teachers working towards national board certification. I also have a master degree in educational leadership a K-12 principal certificate, and a doctorate degree. Now, my doctorate degree focuses on administrative leadership, specializing in teaching and learning, which really speaks to the practitioner educator that I am. Now, besides doing college of education adjunct work for two different universities, I am also an Alaska State Writing Consortium teacher consultant, where I've been providing literacy professional development since 2006 for, my, for teachers in my district and around my state. I am an Alaska State mentor, and in 2019, I wrote a National Education Association three-year grant, just over a million dollars, to fund a mentorship program in my district to support early career educators. Additionally, I am an education consultant working with public, private, and homeschool educators, helping them to achieve their professional goals and overcome instructional and behavioral challenges in their classroom. I am also a digital course and resource creator focusing on elementary educational content, which brings us together tonight. Okay, so I share this just to give you information about who I am. Um, so that way, you know, you know, I've walked in your shoes. I have a lot of experience and expertise in the area that we're focusing on tonight. But as you can see, I love, love education and helping public, private, and homeschool teachers to be a blue ribbon teacher. This work really gets me excited every single day. So that's a little bit about me. And if you'd like to learn more about my work, I'd like to invite you to head over to my website, blueribbonteacher.com, check out some free resources, read a blog post, share your comments, and stay updated on the Blue Ribbon Teacher world by viewing my calendar of events so you know what's going to be happening each month. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe to my weekly newsletter, where I share even more tips, lessons, resources, and inspiration delivered right to your inbox for my Blue Ribbon teacher friends. All right. So again, um, make certain I'd appreciate if you can hit that like button and those heart buttons and um, share the information that we're doing. Go ahead and put a one or a thumbs up, a smiley face in the comment section. So that way I know that you're with me and you're ready to be moving on. Okay. All right, so here we go for today's Teacher Talk Tuesday. Let's dive in. We're going to focus on session two, learning from the experts with model text to unlock writer's block. So by the end of the session tonight, you will learn how you can use model text as a strategy to not only support struggling writers, but also catch a glimpse into how using model text can further develop your writer's skills and strategies across genres and content. All right, my friends, let's dig in and see how we can use the experts to support struggling writers. And I want to preface this session with the synonymous terms that I will be using tonight. Children's text, 
picture book, and mentor text. So when I use the, those words, they all mean the same, the same thing, okay? So here we go, let's take a look. The first strategy that I'd like to share, write this down, is to read lots of children's books. When students are listening to books, they learn about voice, tone, storyline, they create connections, they ask questions, and they make inferences. And all of these skills are skills and strategies that students will then start to emulate in their own writing. There are so many literacy skills developed when books are read to students. I cannot stress the importance of that. It is one of the most important resources to help develop all literacy skills, all of them, reading, writing, listening, speaking, and the fifth, thinking. That's right. So last week, I mentioned the impact of language efficiencies and how this is impacting student progress and, and success in school. And I always share this information I'm sharing with you tonight. I always share this with my families, especially at conferences when we talk about it. I ask or I let them know, why can't I skip my 20 minutes of reading tonight? You know, it's a homework assignment. If, if the student can just read for 20 minutes, it's going to have huge, huge benefits. So I want to share this with you tonight. Why can't I skip my 20 minutes of reading? I want you to look at student A. Student A reads for 20 minutes, five nights every week. Student B reads for four minutes a night or not at all, okay? If student A reads 20 minutes a night, five nights a week, that's 100 minutes a week, right? Simple math. Student B reads four minutes, five times a week. That's 20 minutes a week. When you look at a month, student A will read 400 minutes, student B 80 minutes. Do you see where we're going? Student A reads 3,600 minutes a school year. That's just during, during the school year because we have 36 weeks in a school year. And student B only reads 720 minutes in that 36 weeks. Now student A practices reading the equivalent of 10 whole school days a year extra. That's practice reading. Student B gets the equivalent of only three whole school days of reading practice a year. And if you want to take a screenshot of this, go ahead and, and feel free to do that. When you share this information to parents, and then the next slide that I'll share with you now, it's so, so important that they see the reason why reading every night is a very important, okay? And I let my parents know, depending upon the age, the younger students, you know, it's a back and forth where students, parents can read to the students and students can read to the parents. And then as the kids get older, then the students are more responsible for reading on their own. And I do encourage parents to ask their student about their reading. But look at this, by the end of sixth grade, if student A and student B maintain the same reading habits that I just shared with you, Student A will have read the equivalent of 60 whole school days. Student B will read the equivalent of only 12 school days. Okay, and that's kindergarten through sixth grade. Now I want you to stop and think. There's typically 45 days in a quarter. Okay, so this student is reading a quarter and a half, right? 60 days, whole school days a year. That's a lot of extra reading and practice. Now, based upon all that, one would expect that the gap in information retained will have widened considerably and so undoubtedly will school performance. So how do you think student B will feel about his, sorry, the typo there, his or herself as a student, right? Some questions I want you to ponder. Which student, A or B, would you expect to read better? Which student would you expect to know more? Which student would you expect to write better? Which student would you expect to have a better vocabulary? Which student would you expect to be more successful in school and in life? Now, I've got to tell you that this is so important because when that student is, is reading more and practicing more, not only does it impact their reading, their writing, their listening, speaking, their thinking, right, but it also impacts how they feel about oneself, how they feel about themselves as they are um, learning and, and experiencing different things. Because we know that if we feel that something is hard, we're going to ignore it and we're going to find other things that we can do. Okay, so let me change the slide here. So now look at this. Did you know 
that when students spend 20 minutes a day reading, it can make a huge impact on their overall academic success. I do have the research stated up there if you want to check that out. Um, and that's 1988. It looks like a 3-3, but it's really 88. So this success, as I, sh as I uh, shared before, can trickle down to social, emotional, and behavioral success. Okay, take a look. The relationship among time spent reading, reading achievement, and vocabulary acquisition of fifth graders. 98th percentile, minutes read of independent reading outside of the school day, 90.7, right? And estimated exposure to the number of words per year, 4,733,000. And a student who performs in the 90th percentile, minutes of independent reading outside of school per day would be almost 40 and a half, so 40 minutes. And the exposure, words that they've been um, come across, 2,357,000. In the 70th percentile, they would spend the normal 21 minutes outside of the school day, right? And then, of course, it's just literally half, um, 1,168,000, and then you can read the rest. Okay, so I hope that based upon these last two slides plus this slide and take a snapshot of this one as well, you can see how important it is for our students to engage in uh, reading outside of the school day. It does impact and it has a huge impact on their writing. Okay, let's move on um, to the next slide. Okay. And here we go. One of the things that I want to share with you is that um, Dolly Parton, she has founded an organization called Imagination Library. And this is a great place for students to get free books that's for children ages five and under. So we talk about early childhood and developing reading skills, listening skills. I know my grandson, his mom, of course, she signed up for this program and every single month he gets a book, a free book. And they, whenever you sign up, you put the age of the, of the child. And so they make certain that the book sent match the age, okay? So that the students, the children are interested. They're not students, yeah, they're just their children. But this program, children living in the United States, Australia, Canada, United Kingdom, and the Republic of Ireland can participate. So they receive a book each month without any cost. So take a screenshot of this slide. Check out that website that I have shared there, imaginationlibrary.com. Now, besides the benefit of language development, using a picture book for a lesson is powerful, right? Literally any reading and writing skill and strategy can be taught with a children's book, anything. So today what I'm going to do is show you how easy it is to do this. So this challenge is really focusing on one or two skills or strategies to teach. You know, sometimes when we read a book, we see all these different lessons that we can do. But when you're providing instruction, you just really want to focus on one or two skills or strategies so that way the student can really hone in on that skill and your lesson is not all, all over the place, but is really focused. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to um, add, this is where I'm going to try and use my, my phone as a camera, okay, because I have some books here and I want to show with you how easy it is to, let me set this up, whoops. And let me make the screen a little bit bigger for you. I want to show you how easy it is to help your students who are struggling with writing. Okay, so I'm going to do this lesson here. Um, and I'm going to actually be talking to you as, as a teacher to so just kind of give you some input. Okay, so if I were to do this lesson, I would probably do this at the beginning of the school year. In November, we actually have kindness day on, I think it's November 13th. And so I would pull the kids in front of me and I would, you know, have them, let's look at the, I would say boys and girls, how are you today, right? Let's take a look at this picture. What is it that we see in the picture? And then I would have the students tell me what is it that they see. I would let them know, this title of this book says, what does it mean to be kind? And notice a question mark. And then also the author is Reina de Orio, and it's illustrated by Stefani um, Horacic, okay? And I do the best I can with the pronunciation. And then I let them know, today we're going to be looking at a book and thinking about what does it mean to be kind. So as we're reading, I want you to be thinking about what it means to be kind to others and how others are kind to you. 
So again, our focus is on students who are struggling to write. They have writer's block. And so that's what we're focusing on. Okay, I'm going to kind of go to, to turn the pages here. So what does it mean to be kind? Does it mean being a type or a category? No. Does it mean paying with something other than money? No. Does it mean being sort of something? No. And I would take some time, you know, and ask the students what they see in the picture and um, share, you know, talk about that picture because reading the picture, especially for the younger ones first, is what you want to do. And then you read the text. Older ones, you can read the text and they could look at the picture. All right. So being kind means smiling at the new student in the class. And we could talk about students that we have in our class that are new. Giving someone a compliment. Okay, you know, what is a compliment? And I would ask the students, you know, what is something that you can share with a, another person that makes them feel good, that makes them feel happy? Holding the door open for someone else. And maybe someone um, actually did that for the, the, during the day. And I would say, I really appreciate how Sarah was able to hold the door for our friend. And that was definitely showing kindness. Okay. Sticking up for someone who was being bullied. Seeing the best in people, even when they are struggling to be their best. All right. And at this point, I might stop and think, boys and girls, what are some, some um, acts of kindness that you're thinking about? And then they would articulate those. And then I would ask them, I said, well, why do you think the author is writing about, about this? Why did the author decide to write about what it means to be kind? And we would discuss that a little bit. Okay. So the kids most likely would say because the author wanted to share or share what kindness is or to teach other people about being kind. And then we would continue reading. And I'm not going to read all of this book, but I think you have the idea. So we're going to read. We're going to talk. We're going to allow students to connect, to share some things that they have been doing to be kind with people, to share some examples of what others have done to be kind to them. Okay? So this is a great, great book to use for the purpose. Um, again, you notice in the kind of the first third of the story, I was asking the students, um, besides of examples, I'd ask them, why do you think the author wrote this book? And then the, um, again, towards the middle or the end of the story, you right, we're, again, we're gonna come back to the question, why do you think the author wrote this book? And the students will share their thoughts. And then I'll ask the students, well, what is something that you can do to be kind? And then, and then what we can do together is we can generate a list of things that we have done. I'm going to turn this one off here now. A list of things that we have done to be kind to each other, okay? And then that's, the students are actually going to be coming up with a list of things that they have done to be kind. Now, students could then take this and they could write their own story about one of those opportunities when they were kind, or if they just want to write on one page what they did, that, what they did to be kind to someone, on another page what they did to be kind to someone, on another page what they did to be kind, or what someone did for them, then they could actually write a, a sentence and they could draw a picture. And before you know it, that student has a book. So one of the things that's important is to use the, the um, expert authors, right? And we want to be thinking about what did the author do to write that story? Why was it important for the author to do that? Let me share another one. I've got a, a bunch of books over here. Um, here's one. Let me share this one, okay? And then we'll move on. In our, in our story here. Okay, so this one here is called The Technology Tale. And this is one of my favorite books to read during um, digital citizenship, which is during the month of November as well. And I actually have a YouTube channel, or I have a YouTube channel, but I have a YouTube video posted with The Technology Tale. And on my um, website, I also have some other information and resources, some re re free resources that can help you um, as you're teaching digital citizenship.
But we could use this book. We would again talk about the title. Why, you know, what, what is, what do you think the story is about? Why is the story important? And then I would go ahead and start reading. And this one's written a little bit different. So you can see that it has different fonts and different uh, sizes and different, you know, bold print. So, you know, the students would definitely notice that. And we would talk about why did the author choose to do that? Why did the author want to do, to, to um, use, you know, large print, small print, even different colors. Where did the, as you're reading this, where did the author get the idea to write the story? Maybe the author, you know, wanted to teach about how to be safe on the internet. Why did the author use different text? Because the author wanted to pull your attention and to let you know that this was something important. I don't have a tail, right? So you're going to be reading these stories and asking the students, why did the author do this? Why did, why did the author include this information? And the students will see that the author has something to share. So the author is teaching us important information. Okay, so these, these um, author books are great resources to teach students where to get ideas. And then after I've, and, and what I usually do um, when I'm teaching at the very beginning of the school year, remember I said that after about six to eight weeks, I have no students who are um, afraid of writing and they have lots of things to write about. And that's because I take a lot of time at the beginning of the school year and I am teaching the students where the authors get ideas to write, okay? Um, I have another book here, which I'll share some more later. This one is about the Iditarod. Um, here's another one, the important book, and I'll share this one here in a bit too. But, um, you know, this one here, <laughs> Andrew Clements, The Friendship War. So where did the author get the idea to write these stories is a big question that you always want to make certain that you ask when you're reading any um, children's literature and you're trying to help the struggling writers come up with ideas to write about. Then you eventually are going to write a list, okay? Um, in the course that I was telling you about earlier, I'm going to go into more details on how to do that and I'm actually going to be sharing some of my own lessons and I'll walk you through that process to help those students and get you set up your first six to eight weeks, get you set up for success in your writing classroom. All right, so let's move on here. Um, so the strategy, again, the big focus is to read lots of books, immerse your students into books, and then use picture books to generate ideas to write. All right. So I hope that you were able to see how this one picture book um, you can be used to help your struggling writers overcome writing challenges. Lots and lots of, of resources there. Um, and let me hold on. I got to change the... <laughs> Okay, here, let me back up and I'm trying to, and I got into a little, a little snafu with them when I went back to that. Why did I do that? Okay, what I wanted to share with you is to go to my Blue, my, uh, Blue Ribbon Teacher uh, Facebook, or um, sorry, I'm flustered now. Go to my YouTube channel, Blue Ribbon Teacher. Visit my website, blueribbonteacher.com. And as I, as I shared earlier, remember to subscribe, click the notification bell, and to, send, to set your notifications to all so that you receive all the great resources, tips, lessons, inspirations, and ideas to help you um, in your instruction. Okay, so let's see if I can get, I want to get rid of this little video because you can see. Dun, dun, dun. How am I supposed to get rid of this little video? I don't see the little, the little box. And now this might be on top of everything. So, hmm. So I have more that I want to share with you, but it's behind this video. And I know you don't want to be looking at me the entire time. There it goes. I had to double click on it. Maybe that's it. Ta -da! Figured it out. Okay, good. All right. So um, let me go back to this one here. There we go. Okay. So go ahead and check out my YouTube channel for all the latest videos um, to help you and teach you. Um, and there's my website, blueurbanteacher.com. All right, so 
We went to this this here again. Make certain that you click those hearts and the um, and the the uh, like button, and so that way other people are able to get this information. Okay, is everybody doing okay? Um, type your questions in that in the box there, and I will certainly come back after our session and review that. All right, so now what I'd like to do is to talk about. Um, another strategy. So using the picture books, your expert writers, and to take a look at author format, style, and content. Okay. Um, the book that I was sharing that I told you I was going to share with you is called The Important Book. And I want to read us a little bit of this one. So again, I'm going to um, add a picture in here and hopefully I'm able to get out of it quickly like I did last time. <laughs> So let's see here. And I need to switch over my camera. I thought I could set this up ahead of time. All right, so here we go, the important book. Now, as I read this book, I want you to listen to the form that the author used. And then I'll share with you how I used it for instruction, okay? So again, if we're focusing on supporting students on overcoming challenges, we're going to talk about the important book. What does it mean to be important? Um, this book is by, pull it up here, by Margaret Wise Brown, and she also wrote Good Night Moon, which is a, another great book that um, usually younger students read. So we're going to look here about the important book, okay? And let me open it up some here. So the important thing about glass is that you can see through it. And then we might read that and talk about, huh, what is it that we, should, that we need to remember about the glass, right? You can see through it. Of course you can. And some students might say, well, sometimes there's colored glass. And you know what? You're right. All right, so take a look here at this picture. What do you, what, boys and girls, what is it that you see? And they'll say they see some spoons. Okay, so then you'll say, the important thing about a spoon is that you can eat with it. It's like a shovel. You hold it in your hand. You can put it in your mouth. It isn't flat. It's hollow. And it spoons things up. But the important thing about a spoon is that you eat with it. And then we'll read the next page. And we'll talk about what is it that we see. Okay, daisies, bees. So the important thing about a daisy is that it is white. It is yellow in the middle. It has long white petals and bees sit on it. It has a ticklish smell. It grows in green fields. And there are always lots of daisies. But the important thing about a daisy is that it is white. And then we'll go to the next page. And then the students are going to start to notice a pattern that the author is using in this book, the form, right? We'll talk about what do they see. The important thing about rain is that it is wet. It falls out of the sky and it sounds like rain and makes things shiny. And it does not taste like anything and is a color of air. But the important thing about rain is that it's wet. And now we'll talk about what is it that you notice. And then the students will, well, somebody will obviously say, well, when the author starts writing, the author says the important thing about the, the item, rain, is that it is wet. And when the author ends, but the important thing about rain is that it is wet. It repeats, but it just adds but in front of it. And we'll talk about why did the author do that? Okay, and then why did the author choose to write about the rain? Why did the author choose to write about a spoon? <laughs> That's kind of strange. We'll look at this picture. The important thing about grass is that it is green. It grows and is tender with a sweet grassy smell, but the important thing about grass is that it is green. And then we'll continue reading the rest of the book. The students will look at different things. We'll talk about, you know, recess. The important thing about recess is that you play with your friends. And then the students will, what, what, well, then we'll talk about what do you do at recess? Well, at recess time, I play with my friends on, on the um, jungle gym. When it snows, I, sl I slide down the hill. I run around and um, we play basketball or we play football or tag. And those are all some of those detail sentences. But the important thing about recess is that we have fun or we, we repeat. I forgot what I said at the beginning. Okay. So a student can literally have a thought about, you know, the important thing about a pencil is that it writes. And then they can talk about the pencil is yellow. It writes with gray. 
I can use my eraser to erase the pencil mark. I can write my thoughts down. But the important thing about a pencil is that I write with it, or whatever I said, I forget. <laughs> I need to write it down. But you can see how the author uses the same format throughout the entire book. And I won't read this entire book, but um, this is a great way to use the format that an author uses to encourage your students to write. They just need one little item to think about. Maybe they're a basketball player. The important thing about basketball is that you bounce the ball. And then they could list, we, I play with, with my friends, we have games, we go up and down the court, but the important thing about basketball is you bounce the ball. So I use this book, the important thing, the important book, and I use it, um, this is when I taught fourth grade, and I, um, we have a unit where we study, study our history, right? And so we, so my students, um, they actually, I'll like pick up some of these, these are some of my notes, but they, um, we created a Dynazyke, uh, Dynazyke fold here, and I, we included other things, but what I wanted to share with you is they, did, I, they were learning how to do some research, and they focus on their name, and this here was me teaching them how to use different colors, different fonts in a word, so we included some technology in that as well, and the kids could either write um, in cursive, they always have to write in cursive in my classroom, or they could type um, their their paper, but I wanted to read with read to you what it is that I wrote and how I took the important book form to create the, this writing piece. And my students did the exact same thing. I just don't have one of their samples with me because they took them home. So, did you know that the most important thing about my name is the sound? Then I start listing the information from my research. My name comes from the Hebrew form of Anne. Other ways my name is spelled include Anne, Annette, Annette, and Annetta. I was named after the Mickey Mouse Basketeer, Annette Funicello. Annette is also a classic name. My parents loved my name, but nicknamed me Annie when I was little. My mom said Annie means, a li means little Annette. I like my name, but here's the repeat. Did you know that the most important thing about my name is the sound? Okay, and that is a great way for students to to um, learn about this lesson here, to learn about their name. But what's most important <laughs> is that they're able to use the form from this book to write. Okay, and that's something that um, the students can easily um, incorporate. You know, the most important thing about my chair, the most important thing about my coat, the most important thing about my um lunchbox or whatever it is. Okay. All right. So those are some more strategies that you can use. Um, and see, and I, and I, so I use this book to teach also to teach paragraph writing skills, to teach research writing skills. Like I said, whenever you're teaching, you really want to focus on one thing. If you're focusing on ideas, then let me get rid of so you can see me here. If you're focusing on ideas, then that's what you want to be doing. You don't want to be focusing on different things. But um, depending on, up on where your writers are, okay? So um, you can use the books for different things. But if you are trying to, but the most important thing about using a book is helping students to overcome those challenges, those, those writing challenges. So um, use that to as a guide, okay? Um, and let's go here. So we talked about different strategies, actually, that you could use with that book. Okay. Another thing is, or write this down. I have this, my little notes here. Say strategy using experts and copying their form of writing is a great opportunity to help struggling writers who have challenges, putting their thoughts on paper, coming up with an idea or even organizing their content. So I hope that you can see how you can use those different books that I've shared to help your struggling writers. So now let's take a look at nonfiction. And I've got, let me add another camera on here. I'm getting really good at this camera stuff. <laughs> okay. And using that, I love that I can easily use my phone, but I just really wish that I could have my, my other computer here to see the comments. So um, 
So we're going to use a piece of nonfiction here, and using an expert model to teach nonfiction text conventions is a perfect opportunity to support your students struggling to write nonfiction. Oftentimes, they just don't know where to start. So when studying the format the author used, you are going to look at the main sections and the subsections. You will see a table of contents. But the student can see how these are simply questions that the author researched and then wrote his or her findings. So let's take a look at this book. Um, and this story is called The Iditarod. So we know everything we're going to read is focusing on the Iditarod. Um, you can use this opportunity to teach nonfiction text conventions. So we have, um, let me go back, we have an off a... Um, a table of contents and each section is going to tell us something different, but the big picture is focusing on that title, right? The Iditarod. And you can see here there's more, more parts to the, um, to the um, nonfiction uh, text features and the table of contents. So here we can see that this section is focusing on the Iditarod Trail and notice the subsection, the Race to Save Gnome. The Last Frontier. Notice how we also have you know, some vocabulary words, pictures, captions to go with pictures, and the Gold Rush. So what the student can think of, and, and this actually, there's more questions here, right? But if the student has, an, has a topic that they want to learn about, say they want to learn about berries, okay? So their book could be about berries. They could have re researched three different kinds of berries have you know blueberry, strawberry, raspberry, and they could just write specific information about that. This this could be their blueberry chapter. And then they could just have, you know, ask three questions. If, you know, depending upon on the student, if it's more of an older student, they could have three questions, but the younger student, they could just write some important things. You know, maybe they even want to include a recipe or their favorite um, way to eat those blueberries. But but you, what happens here is it takes that that big um, big project, that big writing project that they have to do, and it breaks it down. So when we look at a piece of nonfiction, I have another one here. This is be for an easier student, or a, not easier, but a younger student, an easier text. But here it's like tree homes, and again we do have our table of contents for focusing on. Terrific trees, birdhouses, and snakes, bugs, and bats. And we're going to be going to look at this is just focusing on the trees. And they're and they're talking about here's a tree, and they write about that. Here's another animal that lives in a tree, and they write about that. Here's an animal that lives in a tree, and they write about that. So you can see that they have their picture, they have their captions, and then they just write a couple of sentences that focus on what that animal does inside that tree and how it's a tree home, okay? Then we have different bird houses. So we have a bird, we talk, and it has the caption, and we talk about the kind of bird that that is and how, what kind of house that bird lives in. We talk about a robin and how this animal lives in a bird house. And we, here we have an owl, and we talk about this type of owl that lives in a, a bird house, right? Um, and right there in the in the tree and, and so we talk about those different animals so that's another way um, here's another book that I have real quick focusing on energy again your table of contents and me this one here again isn't for older students it doesn't have the smaller sections but it does focus on here's like each little section just giving like a little synopsis of each of the different chapters but it just focuses on the beginning, telling some information, using some little, um, you know, caption, ca um, some captions with some more information that talks about it. But these are great ways for students to share something that, like, they want to be an expert at or they want to research and to share it with their, with their peers, okay? It's a great way to help overcome that, that struggle, that challenge that they have. Perhaps a student is interested in basketball or a different sport and they want to, um, to, to teach somebody about that, okay? Not only could they say the most important thing about their basketball and use that form, but they could also, you know, do a little research and write about a basketball player and talk about their, their life, what they did to prepare to, to play basketball or whatever sport, you know, I think you got the idea. But starting to teach 
um, students how to look at the nonfiction and to see how the author has developed it in different form and then used a different style like I shared with you on the um, you know the the um, technology tale where there were different um, um, font sizes, bold print, different colors of text. Those are all things that students can use but in, in their writing, but they need to be able to look at other authors that have done it to see what they've done to be successful so that they can start to put that in their own writing. So I hope that makes sense. So, you know, we looked at how um, a student can copy the author's writing form which is the important book with that last strategy. And then the strategy that I just shared with you focuses on copying the author's nonfiction text format where you have your table of contents, you have your topic, then you have some subtopics within that. So the student can literally take a question and write a subsection about that question, the answer that they found. So this is a great way, as I shared, to take a bigger, more complex writing assignment and break it down into smaller bite-sized pieces. OK, and if you remember when I said the bite size pieces back in session one, we did talk about that. We talked about the continuum of struggle and that big complex piece is like towards the end of that struggle. All right. So how are we doing? Um, let me go ahead and get rid of this picture here and move on. I hope that we're doing all right. Um, I'm going to skip that one because I just did that one there um, again. Click that like button. Um, what am I am I doing? Are you resonating with? Are you writing down comments, um, questions that you have? If you're watching us on the replay, go ahead and click that replay. Um, we're coming to the end, and here at the end, I I just have some final little tips. Okay, so I shared some different strategies on using fiction and nonfiction text, some picture books, children's lit, mentor text. So now I just have some quick tips that I'd like to share with you. All right, so one, number one, take time to immerse yourself in reading children's literature. There are so many lessons that can be lifted from the text to support your struggling writers, and I shared several of those different lessons tonight. The more books you read, you'll soon become an expert at pulling lessons from the picture books. And like I said, the challenge will be just focusing on one or two skills or strategies that you, that you want to teach. But from the reading and writing the students, they make content connections, right? And then they pull on the expertise of the authors. That is a sure way to engage your students and support their literacy skills while overcoming those challenges. Another tip that I have for you, give students time to share their writing with each other. Oftentimes that peer-to-peer -peer support is just what a struggling writer needs when figuring out what to write about and those peer connections are invaluable. And then finally, if students are having a hard time figuring out what to write about, allow the student time to read books anywhere, classroom library, a comfy corner or a chair anywhere. Based upon the modeling you are doing, because you're reading a lot of children's text, right? To help your students generate ideas from your read alouds, students will begin to have those same conversations. And before you know it, a new story is generated and ready to be put on paper. Okay, so as we're, as we're talking about these picture books, so here's some tips that I have for you on using these picture books. Use fiction and nonfiction. Read both. Use a variety of genre, adventure, fantasy. Read poetry, right? Read familiar text students have heard before and new text that they have not heard. When you're teaching, focus on one skill or strategy at a read or at a time. And when you're reading, you can always go back and review skills that you've had, that you've already taught, right? Because students will, will be identifying with that. When you're reading, model what to think aloud. Let the students know what you, as the experienced reader, what you're thinking about. And allow students to identify the skills and strategies Okay, because there's that reading and writing connection, right? And then also create anchor charts. When you create anchor charts, the information is posted in the classroom and the students you'll find will always go back to look at that anchor chart and that will help them to think about, oh yeah, that's what we talked about. All right, my friends. So these are just a few more strategies. I'm looking at that time is a little later than what I wanted to go, but these are just a few more strategies and tips that you can add to your instructional toolbox to support your struggling writers to overcome challenges and become more confident in his or her writing skills and strategies. And how else do you use mentor text to support your learners? 
Perhaps you have some strategies that will help others. And I'd like for you to share those in the comments. And then we can add those to our toolbox. And as other people come to watch this video, they can also read the comments and they can see what you've written and they can add that to their own toolbox as well. All right, so I hope that um, we're doing well. I know that your brain may be on overload and there's a lot of information that I shared. I've shared multiple ways to use mentor text to support struggling writers, but also advance their writing and their reading skills. Um, using these strategies, right, and tips alongside the numerous strategies that I shared in session one and your struggling writers, they will become a successful writer. That writer's block will become extinct, okay? So this is going to wrap up our session tonight. Please let me know how these instructional strategies are helping you with your struggling writers. Also, let me know if you've tried a strategy and you didn't experience success. And I'd like to help walk you through that to see that so that you can be successful. I'd love to hear about your successes, um, questions that you might have, and any more ideas if you would like some more training. I'd be happy to hear some ideas from you that you would like some more support on. So remember to tag me in your social media posts and email me anytime at Annette at BlueUrbanTeacher.com. I love, love, love hearing from you. So next week, join me next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel for session three. We're going to focus on differentiating with multiple intelligences to unlock writer's block. Now, did you know your student's learning intelligence? Do you know what it is? Oftentimes, their students have two intelligences that they favor. But once you can pinpoint this background, this um, background knowledge about your student, you'll be able to meet the student on his or her playing field and make a huge impact not only in writing, but also learning across all content areas. So we'll take a look at that next week. OK, remember to follow me on social media, my YouTube channel and visit my website for some high quality content and free resources. And I also share more tips, lessons, and inspiration in my weekly newsletter. So if you have not subscribed, you might consider doing that. And if we are not connected on social media, let's connect. All right, my friends. Um, don't forget, um, next or see or next uh, Monday, I am also going to be sharing Monday nights, um, four or 5.30 um, Pacific time, I'm going to be sharing the new course that I'm launching, which is really going to take what we're learning here and launching it into the next phase, okay, to support your writers, not to, they've already overcome the challenges of writing. Now they are ready to soar and we're going to, the course is going to focus on that part of it. But thank you for stopping by tonight and participating in our training session. Thank you for giving me some grace tonight as I was working through using my um, phone as a second camera. It's my first time doing that. I appreciate your grace and, um, and patience with me. Did you find this, um, that this information tonight valuable in our professional learning series? You know, if you did, there may be another friend, colleague who will too. So please share and invite them to learn more about this resource. Um, I am so excited, as I shared before, um, that I am putting the finishing touches on that new course, Creating a Culture of Writers, and I'm going to launch that next week. So, so excited. So this course, as I shared, is going to build up on the work that you've been learning here, and it's going to set you up for a solid foundation in writing pedagogy and practices. So remember to comment hashtag replay. If you are watching the replay, drop those questions and comments in the box too. And if you are loving this training series, please let me know. And I'd love to hear other topics that you'd like me to provide some training on, on our Teacher Tuesday, Teacher Talk Tuesday. Oh, say that really fast. All right, friends. That's all I have for tonight. That's going to be a wrap. I'll see you next week and have a blessed day. Bye-bye.